an embarrassment to every poodle that ever lived. Oh, oh Jaws? Yeah, well, that, yeah, yeah, them too. Uh, okay. is, I, I'm ready. I'm ready when you are. You ready? Yeah, I'm ready. Okay. All right, on five. Wait. All right, all right, I'll wait. I think wait, um, raise to record, actually. Yeah. The recording has started. Watch it, Sam. Thank Record, you. Recording in progress. Up. Okay. All right. You guys all set? Everybody ready? There, I'm all hearing right. some jaws in the background from somewhere. I do too. How about now? Nope. Nope. Okay. We're good. Five, four, three, two, one. Hi, everyone. Welcome once again to In Perspective. My name is Bob Branco. This is episode number 213, Audio and now, with me, and with me as always, my friend and colleague, Peter Alchel. Peter, how are you today? Uh, we're doing fine. It's very muggy and warm and disgusting, typical Missouri summer, but we're doing fine. Disgusting? Yes, disgusting. Does that mean it's, humid? It means humid. It means, you you know, in the, in the mid to upper 80s, usually it sometimes gets to the upper 90s, these times in over 100 degrees. Today is relatively cool, but it's very, very humid. So. Well, I think I'm going to tease our producer, Raymond Gay. Um, a few days ago, uh, Tropical Storm Elsa was in his vicinity. I mean, he's on the other side of Florida, but he was still in the vicinity. So I could always say that he sent her my way because we got a glimpse of her this morning. It was pretty hectic for a while, but fortunately, the storm has passed. Thank you, Ray, for shipping Elsa up here. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, before we continue, let me thank those people who make it possible for In Perspective to be aired and to be seen and archived. We start out with Raymond Gay, our producer, for making our show a quality show. I want to thank Jacqueline Sylvia, our website designer, who archives In Perspective programs on my website, which is www.brancoevents.com. Just go there. Arrow down until you see In Perspective podcasts. Click on those, and you will see our archived shows from latest to earliest. I also want to thank Thomas Dolly of Rosie's Place, a chat line. He posts our shows on greeting door number 15 on Rosie's Place. Thank you, Tom, for doing that. And Merci. finally, I'm sorry, go ahead. Finally, I want to thank the media outlets for airing our program. There are a lot of them, and I want to thank them very much for airing In Perspective when they do. Peter, what and, were you going to say? I was just going to do my usual merci, Jackie, and thanks to everybody else who makes this happen. And Ray, we forgive you for shipping that storm to, uh, to Boston. <laughs> okay, so today we're going to be talking about eating habits, how to keep healthy, how to eat good food, how to stay nutritious. So without further ado, allow me to introduce Stephanie Boulay a dietitian with Coastline Elderly Services. And by the way, Stephanie, I used to work there. So I know that Coastline is a very credible agency here in New Bedford, Massachusetts. <laughs> they, offer a, they offer a lot of very, very important programs to elders uh, here in the city and surrounding towns. And so you work for a very good organization. Let me start out there. Stephanie, yes. welcome. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. Um, yeah, I know a lot of people that I work with now I used to work with you, Bob, you know, when you were at Coastline. So yeah, I feel like we're all connected in a way. I would suppose we are. I hadn't worked yeah. there since 2001, but mm -hmm. I'm glad to hear that there are still people who work at Coastline who remember those days. Yes, yes. Stephanie, you are a dietitian. Could you explain if there is a difference? the difference between a dietitian and a nutritionist? Yeah, so there absolutely is a difference. So um, you can be a registered dietitian or a nutritionist. A nutritionist, anybody can call themselves that. They can go online. They could, you know, do like a, a one-hour thing, get a certificate, print it, and say that they are a nutritionist a registered dietitian, which is my credential, um, that is someone who went to a didactic school um, for nutrition and dietetics. It's a four-year school. 
Um, and then once that's completed, you have to get into a 1200 hour internship at a hospital. Um, so you can get a lot of clinical experience. Then once that's completed, you take a national exam and then you're a registered dietitian. And then we also have 75 CEUs that we have to do every five years. So, you know, we have a lot of experience, you know, just right off the bat, you know, we're very science-based, uh, you know, trying to combat all the, the diet fads and everything, you know, that kind of goes on. Um, so if you have somebody who has an RD title, just know that they went through a lot of schooling to get that credential. Okay, I have two questions that I didn't have prior to your response to my original question. Tell me okay. what is di what is didactic and what is a CEU? <laughs> what is a CEU? So, um, well, a didactic program, um, you know, basically a nutrition and dietetic program is one that is very science based. So, if you want to become an RD, you have to go to those schools that offer those specific classes. So it's just a fancy term for kind of, you know, a nutrition science, if you will. Um, so yes, yeah, so we take a lot of chemistry, organic chem, biochem. So we take a lot of those kinds of classes so that way we can understand really how the body works. Um, and then uh, as CEU, that's a continuing education credit. So, you know, nurses have to get that, doctors have to get that. So it's not that, you know, you kind of get your degree and then you just sit on it. You know, they want you to continually being educated. So, you know, you have to take classes, you know, do, you know, listen to podcasts, like all these different things. Um, so that way you can continue to grow in the field. So Stephanie, talk about your internship. You talked about having to do a certain number of hours at a hospital or someplace. Talk about the kinds of things you do there. Yeah, so it's been a while since my internship. It's been um, maybe close to eight years. And I know that a lot of other people have, um, or I actually did it with South Coast Hospitals Group. So I was local. I was very happy about that. Um, and I know they've changed a lot of things now, but in my internship, you know, they would have you do six weeks, you know, in the ICU, you know, um, working with people who are on, you know, ventilators and, and things like that and tube feeds, you know, then maybe three weeks later, you're working with WIC, you know, um, uh, women, infants and children. And then maybe another week you're working, you know, with geriatrics and another, so it's, you know, they give you such a broad range of um, just to kind of get your feet wet and understand, you know, this is, uh, there's so many different things that you can do in this field. Even we went, um, we had renal dietitians or, you know, kidney dietitians. So we would go to dialysis clinics and we would be under their wing and, you know, learn about that. So every, you know, it's every internship does it a little bit differently, um, but that's how um, South Coast Hospital Group had done my internship. So yes, that was 1200 hours. That's a lot of hours. How, how many years is that? Uh, it's actually only nine months, 40 oh, nine hours months. a week. <laughs> oh, yeah, okay. But that's, yeah. Still, that's still a big, big chunk of time. It, it is. It is, you know. So it's, it, I'm glad that it's done, you know, and that I don't have to go through that now, you know, because I have a family now. And that would be really hard to, you know, kind of just start now in this season in my life, you know, trying to do an internship like yeah, that. Yeah, well, I, I, I do. I, you know, social workers have to do something similar. So it, it, yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. But, it's, but uh, my question for you is social workers, and like this doesn't sound like it's it's different it's different for our dietitians. You can sort of choose your your field of interest with, within mm -hmm. certain limits, and it sounds like you, you you know you sort of did the generalist thing rather than choosing whatever ex thing you were you thought you were most interested in. Is that well, you, normal or is that? Okay. Well, you know, it's funny when we were doing our internship, and this happened with most other girls that were in the internship. We're there, but we're like, we don't know what we want to do. It's like, we know what we like, and then we know what we don't like, you know? So it's like, what do I want to be when I, when I grow up? And the, the nice thing is that there's so many different venues. So, you know, if I wanted to do clinical and work in a hospital for a while, I could do that. Um, but, you know, for me, like when it was, when it was over, my internship was over, we were just like, we'll take anything, you know, <laughs> kind of like poor college kids, sure. you know, we were sure. like, we'll, we'll take anything, you know, and um, 
after I graduated from college, I worked at WIC. I was a nutritionist at WIC. You didn't have to be an RD at the time. Um, so I worked there. And then when I was done I with my internship, I worked for Head Start. Um, and then from there, it was, it was kind of funny. So I did a lot of like prenatal, picky children. And then I started working for Coastline. So it's like I got, you know, all... I feel like the age groups kind of, you know, like the moms and the dads and the kids. And then now, you know, more seasoned people, you know, that's who I'm, I'm with now. So it's been really cool to get, you know, all seasons of life because everybody's going through different stages, you know, so each stage comes with its own challenges, you know, um, but it's, yeah, it's been, it's been a cool ride. So, so uh, I, I just one other question before we veer into sort of standard fare as I sort of view it. Um, can you talk a little, you worked for both WIC and uh, Head Start and those are, are for people uh, with limited, limited income. Can you talk about the this the sort of unique challenges folks with limited limited income experience uh, with 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 uh, uh, getting a healthy diet? Yeah, you know, I can remember one time. Um, one big uh, challenge with WIC is that you know we would give out one percent milk, right, because it's lower in saturated right. fat. Um, well, I remember one mom, one time she was like, I really want to get whole milk. My, my family loves whole milk. Can you just give me whole milk? I'm like, I'm sorry. Like we can't do that. And so she was like very frustrated with me and I'm like, what do I do in this situation? You know? And I started like asking her food insecurity questions. Cause we had to ask everybody that. And she sure. broke down crying you know, I don't have enough food to feed my family. You know, it wasn't like the milk that was the issue, mm -hmm. you know, that was kind of like the straw that broke the camel's back, sure. you know? And sure. so I would say things like, you know, she's like, my husband's out of work. And, you know, I'm like, whoa, I heard that so-and-so is hiring. She goes, we don't have a car. How do I get him there? There's no like bus stop near that area where I could get dropped off. And I thought, whoa, Wow. Okay. You know, so there was a lot of things like that, that, that I just didn't think of, you know, if I need to go somewhere, I just hop in my car and I go, Yeah. you know, if I want to get the kind of milk I want, like I can go to the store and get whatever I want. So I found that, you know, that was really challenging. It's like resources. So it's like, okay, you know, where, how can I connect you with someone? How can I, you know, what programs can I introduce you to? Um, so I think that really changed my perspective on some of the things that, you know, I thankfully, you know, I didn't struggle growing up as a kid, you know, like with that. Yeah, um, yeah. So it was it was good for me to see that side of things. So that one, was definitely a challenge. One other, one other uh, Bob, I know you, you I'm, I'm, I'm hijacking you, but one other question. Can you talk about the concept of, of food deserts? Uh, that must have been an issue you might have experienced, you know, whether you just can't find a grocery store that, that sells fresh vegetables, for example, within driving distance or walking distance. Was that something you experienced when you were doing that work? Uh, you know, I did, I found that a lot of people who couldn't drive or they only did their groceries once a month, um, you know, that they would just go to Cumbies and get, you know, potato chips and, you know, other things like that. And they're like, I can't, I only get a ride like once a month to do my groceries. So if I need any other little things, like they'll just go to the local Cumbies and mm. get that, you know, so it was it's like, all right, well, I know some of them started like putting in bananas and trail mix, you know, and all that. So I feel like a big part of my job is just navigating those kinds of circumstances, yeah. you know, like even at my, at my work, you know, they have a lot of, you know, like vending machines and other things like that. And it's like, okay, so how can I pick something from here that I'm going to feel satisfied? It's going to satisfy my hunger and I'm going to, you know, like feel good about eating this particular snack, you know? I'm um, so. curious. I'm curious to know how those vending machines are stocked. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, it's, it's a mixture, you know? I mean, I did see things like trail mix and, uh, you know, sometimes they'll stock them with salads, you know, but then, you know, of course they also have the other things, you know, but that's anywhere you go, right? Like even yeah. if you go to the store, you go to Target, you know, when you're, and the, uh, the in line waiting, of course, they put all these beautiful things in front of you and toys for the kids and like all these candies. And you're like, ah, oh, you know, it's like, hmm, which one can we pick from here? That would be a better choice, you know? So I feel like we have to navigate that everywhere we go. Stephanie, 
am I correct in assuming that most people misinterpret the true definition of diet? I know when I was younger, I always thought that when you went on a diet, you have to limit the food that you eat, when in fact diet is simply a routine that's best for all of us, or a diet could just mean a list of foods that you should eat or a list of foods that you do eat, not necessarily limiting what you eat. Mm-hmm. Am I correct about this? Yeah. Well, you know, the, t- the definition of diet is your regular pattern of eating. It's right. It's, as, as, you as, opposed to, as opposed to a misconception that a lot yeah. of us had back in the day. You know, we've made eating far too complicated. We, we really have in this country. I mean, we go through all kinds of crazy fads and things that everybody's trying to focus on or like carbs are bad. No, fat is bad. Like, it, you know, all of this, it can make it so, so confusing. And, you know, I had done a home visit recently in my current job and, I, and they had asked me like, well, are you going to come up with a diet plan? You know, because I think sometimes people are just looking, just tell me what to do, you know? And I said, well, actually, you know, I want to create, or I want to give you some ideas on how you can change the way that you're eating that you can follow for the rest of your life. You know, it's about making and incorporating these small changes because, you know, a lot of us have had our eating patterns our whole lives, you know, and you're not going to change that overnight. You know, and that's why a lot of these fad diets don't work like the keto diet and all of that. They may work. You may lose weight. But that's not a regular pattern of eating. You know, eventually you kind of go back and then all the weight comes back on. And then it's this yo-yo dieting, you know, yo-yo, like with the weight increase and weight decrease, you know. So it's, yeah, so it's, it's about making changes. And I can attest to this personally, because I actually had no interest in nutrition at all. Um, and I grew up, you know, eating like lucky charms. We had soda, we had ice cream every day, pizza, you know, all the things, you know, that, um, and I think about it now. And then when I first, like my interest was peaked, I thought, okay, how do I, I'm going to start buying whole wheat bread. I heard this is a thing. So (laughs) I'm going to buy whole wheat bread, find one that I like and switch out the white, you know, and I did that. Yeah. I, and I did yeah, that. Right. And now I can't imagine my life without it. But if I were to change everything overnight, it's like, this is too hard. This is overwhelming and I'm going to quit, you know? So when I work with people, you know, one-on-one, you know, like we kind of go over, okay, what is it that, that you're eating? You know, what can we tweak? What can we change? You know, so that's more the approach that dietitians are taking now, as opposed to, oh, we need to count calories. We need, we're, we've actually come a long way from that. We don't count calories anymore, but we look at food groups and we look at portions, you know, cause it kind of makes it a little bit easier for everybody. So, so help me with this. You don't count calories anymore. That was such a big deal even oh, 20 I years know. ago. So let's, I let's know. talk about that. I, I'm, yeah. I, that, that surprises me. So, <laughs> so let's, let's talk, you know, so how, how do we do things differently now than we did say 20 years ago? Yeah. So, yeah. So we tried to get away from counting calories because, you know, we find that a calorie um, processes differently in the body. You know, there have been actually a huge study was done on protein recently that you can actually burn more calories when you eat protein as opposed to other foods. Now, that doesn't mean that you can go crazy and go keto and go, you know, all go all haywire with it, you know, but basically, you know, it's just about thinking about what it is that's on your plate. If you've seen my plate now, it used to be the my pyramid and you had to try and figure out how many food groups you had to eat and all that. I don't know if you guys remember my pyramid. Uh, like, I do. Yes. Yeah. I, have you seen my plate? Have you seen that they changed it? You know, like maybe no. five, six years ago. No. Well, yeah. So my plate is a great resource and it just simplifies eating for everybody. So they say half your plate should be fruits and vegetables right? So say you're having, you know, like it's dinner time, you have like a salad and then maybe a piece of fruit after dinner, right? Then the other half, a quarter of your plate should be your protein. So that is your steak, your chicken, your fish. Then the other quarter of your plate should be your mashed potatoes, your rice and all that. So getting everybody to say like, okay, you need so many ounces of protein. You need so many cups of vegetables in a day. It makes it so much easier than like, okay, how many calories is in an eggplant? 
you know, it <laughs> too much it, math, it's too much, it's <laughs> yeah. way too much. It's way too much. Again, you're thinking about like eating patterns. So, so one nice thing with COVID, I have to say, we're talking about like changing your eating patterns and all of that. I love roasting vegetables. I love it because they, the vegetables taste so much better, but I make a huge pan of it. I'll have it with supper. And then in the morning, cause I'm thinking about my plate and I'm thinking about my portion of vegetables that I'm supposed to be having. I have leftover vegetables from the night before, like say if it's like Brussels sprouts, I love those Brussels sprouts and onions and garlic and all that. I'll have it with like my scrambled eggs, you know? So it's like, okay, this is a little more balanced, you know? So that's why we're trying to get away from, you know, counting calories because nobody wants to do that. And yeah. no dietitian wants, wants to do that. I mean, unless there are certain circumstances, you know, certain illnesses and you're trying to increase calories. I mean, you know, there's, there are situations where, you know, a dietitian would do that, but for the general public, we're saying, no, you know, your, your, your protein portion should be, you know, the palm of your hand, you know, like, so that's what we're trying to do now. So it's half quarter, quarter, right? Half is the yep, half quarter, fruit, quarter, quarter you know, is and, the protein and, and the other quarter is the yeah. starch or whatever. The, yeah. yeah. And the so, problem is when we go out to eat, you know, we go to a nice Italian restaurant, yeah. the whole plate is I was the, gonna say. the carbohydrate. <laughs> well, well, not only that, Stephanie, but all the restaurants I go to, I shouldn't say all of them, but most of them. They give you a lot more than you can handle, oh, no matter what it is. I not me. Know. You know, and, well, and not you, it, but I'm saying the restaurant, Peter. No, I know, I know what you're saying. I, but I, I eat a lot of food. So what, what can I tell you? Oh, okay. Go, go right. ahead. All go right. ahead, right. Stephanie. Yeah. You know, and, and then of course, when you're at a restaurant and, you know, you're talking with friends, you, you're eating more, you're happy, there's music where everybody's getting together, you know, and so you end up eating a whole lot more, you know, than you normally would. But, you know, you can, I, my mother-in-law, this is what she does whenever she goes out to eat, you know, she already gets a to-go box, mm -hmm. puts half of it in there, and then she takes the rest of it home, you know, so that way she doesn't like kind of mindlessly eat it while, you know, everybody's all together, which I was like, oh, that's, that's a pretty good that's tip there. So I, I need your help with something, Stephanie. Okay. I, I, I am a chocolate fan. I like dark chocolate mm -hmm. and that's not part of your, your diet recommendation. So what do I do? Actually, it is. <laughs> oh, thank you for telling me that. I appreciate knowing that stuff. <laughs> yeah. yeah. You know, I, and, and I'm saying that because, you know, everything can fit into your diet. When, so when we start labeling foods, this is a good food, this is a bad food. When we eat that food, guilt is associated with it sometimes. So when we're eating, we shouldn't feel guilty about that, you know? So it's, you know, about making all foods are acceptable again, within moderation, you know, like we shouldn't be having like five chocolate bars a day, you know, but if you wanted to have, you know, some dark chocolate, you know, then like, then that's okay. You know? And I look personally, I'm a Hershey's fan, you know, mm -hmm. like I yeah. love Hershey's chocolate. Like that's, that's my favorite. And you know what? I have it. And people are shocked and they're like, you're eating chocolate. I'm like, of course I'm eating chocolate. I love chocolate. <laughs> like who doesn't love chocolate? You know, no, I'm glad like you said moderation, Stephanie, because yeah. a, a lot of people are afraid. In other words, here's an example. Let's say somebody finds out that they're diabetic. Right. All of a sudden, oh my God, I can't eat any more sugar. Mm -hmm. Or if a doctor tells somebody you're eating too many carbs. Oh my God, I can't eat any more carbs then. Right. Right. This is why I'm glad you said moderation because there's nothing wrong with moderation. Right. Right. Well, and, but, but, and right. I mean, if, if a person has a medical condition, the doctor says you, you need to cut back on your, on your carbs. That means something, right? It does. It means you may, may have to cut it back by quite a lot, depending on what your situation is. Right. Exactly. So if you have a medical condition, you know, then, you know, if you're diabetic, you can still, have you know so a sweet if you want just make sure that you prepare for it you know you have right. like the right medicine you you bring a little bit more insulin with you if you're going to a birthday party you know it was funny because i i was having a conversation with someone and this person was younger and she was uh she had diabetes and and um we were talking and she was like you know oh i can't eat an i can't eat an apple because i think i had a bunch i was like do you want an apple she's like no i can't have it i'm diabetic as she's eating cake oh i'm great. like so that, so it's sometimes it's like that mindset of, 
okay, it's fruit, it's got fiber, it's got all kinds of vitamins and minerals, you know, like that's a better choice than the cake. Like, no, and, and I wasn't suggesting to her like, oh, you should have this apple in place of cake. Right. I think I went to an apple, like I went apple picking and had apples and she was like, no, I can't have that on my diet. So, so what made the, her think, what made her think that cake was more important than an apple? You know, I think she just wanted to have, like maybe that's the forbidden food, you know, I'm, I'm going to eat this. Like, even though I'm probably not, but I'm going to eat this cake, you know, but in my line of work, like that's what we're trying to eliminate is all foods can fit in moderation, you know, like if you're going to a birthday party, you should have a piece of cake, you know, like that's okay. You know, like trying to, you know, get out of that mindset sometimes is really, is really uh, tricky. So, so help me with this. Um, uh, Because obviously if if you eat more food than you usually do, you're going to put on, you know, a few, a few, I don't hate to use the word calories, but you're going to put on a little bit of weight. Right. How does exercise fit into all of this? Yeah. So exercise is, exercise is really important because, you know, for one thing, you know, and just talking about it, just health in general, it helps you sleep. It, you know, people have endorphins, it, you know, helps with depression. Uh, it helps your heart be healthier. I mean, there's so many other parts that we have to look at, you know, when we're looking at the body, when we're looking at just feeling better overall general health, exercise is a huge part of that because your heart is a muscle, just like all of our other muscles in our body, right? We have to exercise that we have to make it work. So, you know, when, especially as we age too, you start to lose 1% of your muscle mass after the age of 40. Okay. So your muscles are always building up and breaking down, building up and breaking down. So if you're after a certain age, you know, a lot of people start saying like, man, I'm losing my muscles, you know, like I, I'm having a little bit more fat around areas where I didn't have that before, you know, an exercise and eating like, you know, protein, like that can help combat that muscle loss. So it's all connected you know, and, uh, you know, and heart disease, of course, we know, like, that's like the number one killer of men and women, you know, and getting exercise, making that heart stronger. And it also makes you lose weight, too, which is also important, you know, just losing five to 10% of your body weight can have huge effects on your cholesterol, your blood pressure, all of that. So yeah, so it's all connected. So uh, I, I heard somewhere, um, and I'm curious to know your reaction to this, mm-hmm. that, you, you don't lose weight by exercise. You lose weight by eating less food and eating more of the right kind of food. Exercise lots, does a lots of other great things that you've talked about, but you can't lose weight per se by exercising more. What, do you have any thoughts about that? Uh, well, you know, I think it would maybe depend on the person. You mm-hmm. know, if you're talking with someone, you know, like myself who maybe just needs to to tone up a bit and is eating a little healthier, you know, and they're gaining muscle. So like if you're exercising, it looks like you're not shedding pounds or maybe you're gaining pounds, but you're actually gaining more muscle. Mm -hmm, So mm -hmm. I think sometimes it depends on the person, but you know, I was just talking with someone today who had knee surgery and now they're walking around, they're starting to lose weight because they're, they're moving their body, they're burning more calories. So, you know, so I don't, fully agree with that. I think you need both of them. You need both of them. Okay. Uh, I, I, I have one other sort of question for you. Uh, and that is to do if somebody is like wildly overweight and they, and they, you know, they start losing weight and, and then they they get in a plateau, which was, I understand things is fairly normal, but what I've heard is that the metabolism slows down when the weight and it gets harder and harder to lose weight. Um, is that something you've heard about? And if that's true, what do you do about that? Yeah, so it actually is true. And I listened um, to a really interesting study that's being done at one of the colleges, I can't think of the the name, Um, but they work specifically with people who are plateauing, you know, Mm -hmm. they've done everything, you know, they're still eating well, and they're still exercising. And now like their metabolism is kind of like caught up and it's like, whoa, we're going to stop. Right, right, right. Um, so what, so what they do um, is they do weight training. That's all that they do. They do a ton of weight training with them. And that seems to help shift the metabolism. Um, I don't know 
how much they did. I heard about this study a couple of years ago, mm -hmm. um, but they, I know that they were having some really great results with that. So sometimes it's just shifting what you're doing, changing what you're doing. Um, and I know that, like I was saying, like the, um, the muscle, like training the muscles, weight training, that's a huge part in it as well. So yeah, but that so, plateau. So what do you say, what do you, I'm sorry, forgive me. I keep going. Oh, uh, no, go ahead. <laughs> go ahead. Okay. Uh, uh, so when you say weight training, I assume you mean like using weights and like yes. lifting weights in, in different yes. ways or using weights with different parts of your body or something. Yep, uh, exactly yeah, exactly that. So, yep. so it's, it's not, it's not cardio. It's right. It's, it's weight, it's weight training. Yes. Interesting. Interesting. Yeah. That's mm -hmm. yeah. Cause I, I read, you know, that must, I mean, I can only imagine for folks who are really trying to lose weight, how frustrating that can be. Right. I mean, they're doing everything right. Oh. And then, Especially uh, when you get older. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah. And, and they're and they're stuck on a weight, and then they get frustrated, and then they put more weight back on. You know, and yeah. it, it, it's it's you know it's just a real puzzle. So I'm glad that's, that's interesting information. Do you think that there's a concern in this country, as I've been hearing a lot on the news, Stephanie, about obesity running rampant? You know, I think, especially after COVID, <laughs> probably, I mean, yes, obesity is a huge, huge issue. But you know, when COVID happened, everybody was putting on weight, everything was closed, you know, like everybody was getting takeout, we were all home, all the gyms were closed, everybody put on weight, myself included, you know, I don't know of a single person that was like, yeah, no, I was totally fine. <laughs> Well, that, that only proves eating. the point. That only <laughs> proves the point that uh, we need exercise in order to lose weight. That proves yeah. it. Yeah, yeah, exactly. We were all home, sitting around, all making starter sourdoughs. You know, everybody <laughs> was doing that. Yeah. Um, you know, but it it was it was everybody. Everybody I knew was putting weight on because we just weren't moving our bodies, and we were stress eating too. Yep. That's another part of it. You know, like myself included. Like I came home with pop tarts and I haven't had pop tarts since I was like 15. My husband's like, what are you doing? I'm like, I don't know. I bought pop tarts. Pop tarts. Pop tarts. I, yeah. I'd rather have dark chocolate, but anyway, dark go, chocolate. Yeah, yeah. 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 I'm like, I haven't had these in like 20 years. I'm like, what is wrong with me? You know? So I think, uh, yeah. So if people are stressed, they tend to eat more and, you know, you know so it's kind of a vicious cycle. So yeah, obesity is definitely, a huge problem but you know i see things are are sh they're shifting they're changing you know people are um becoming more aware of what they're eating what they're putting into their body you know like when i was growing up everybody wanted to be so thin 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 super thin fat was bad you know all of that and now it seems like especially even like with this like younger generation that's coming in it's like oh, okay like we want to grow it. We want our food to be local. You know, we want, you know, the, the animals to be treated properly, like, you know, and eating more natural, you know, as people say. So I I'm seeing that now, even in the population that I'm working with now, that there are a lot of people that are like, yeah, I want to be putting good food. Is this, is this a good option? Should I be having this? Is this better than this? You know? So, so I think that's, that's a step in the right direction. So, um, Talk to me, um, there's a lot of talk about more hormones in foods these days, especially in packaged foods. And, and, and some people are talking about how people are getting bigger and, and uh, taller and, and, and fatter, if you will, um, uh, because of those hormones. Is how, how, how true is, are those kinds of things? So actually, you know, it's funny, it's funny that you're, you're talking about that because I was just reading an article about eggs and, um, you know, the different labeling of eggs. So when they say, oh, there's no hormones in these eggs. Well, actually that's, that's right. Like they're not supposed to, <laughs> you know, right. oh, there's no, there's no hormones in this milk. Well, yeah, they're, they're not supposed to. So I think it's all a huge marketing thing, you know, like are no antibiotics were used. Well, you know, the law states that if your cow is sick and is on antibiotics, you can't use their milk. So when they're like, there's no antibiotics in this, people think this is healthy. This is the best one. And it's like, eh, they gotcha. You know, they're so good at putting forth these labels that make us think like, oh, this is, this is fantastic. You know, um, you know, even like uh, the label, I think it's cage free, like, oh, this mm -hmm. is a cage free 
bird uh, uh, that you're you're eating or a cage free egg, but you know that has like a lot of limitations um, on still on what that bird can do. You want to choose, you know, free range. Free range is better because you know even though they're cage free, they could still be cooped up in like a cement building, mm -hmm. and that's considered cage free. You know, so it's like they try to get you in all these different ways to make you think, oh, I'm purchasing like a good product. And then, you know, come to find out, oh, you know, that was a marketing thing. So, yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. So, so you, you don't, you don't take this hormone thing very seriously. Is what I'm hearing you say. You don't think that because, you know, uh, uh, I mean, people are sort of talking about how people are taller than they were than the prior generation and, and heavier and their puberty is coming faster and so on and so forth. Uh, you don't think that 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 hormone thing is anything to do with it? You know, I, I, I can't speak to that specifically the hormones. Cause I, I'm trying to think of when I was younger, what the regulations were back then. I mm -hmm. mean, I know now things are a lot more different. Um, but you know, as I remember in my internship, there was one of the, um, um, the dietitians there who felt very strongly about high fructose corn syrup because the body metabolizes it very differently. And back, you know, and leave it to beaver days, you know, that you'd have a Coca-Cola, it was really small, right? It wasn't right. like this super gulp, huge, huge kind of thing. And now, you know, they started adding like high fructose corn syrup into everything. The body's processing it differently. And, you know, once the liver processes it, it dumps it kind of like in the love handles area, dumps, dumps, mm -hmm, dumps. Because mm -hmm. we didn't see love handles a lot back in Leave It to Beaver days, but we see that now. And I'm not saying that high fructose corn syrup is like the reason. I think it's a ton of reasons why America is now like the way that, that it is. Um, you know, and the bigger portion sizes, everything has to be bigger. Super gulps are huge, you know, yep, go and yep. fast food. I, you know, and, and it's, it's, they know what they're doing. You know, these companies that are putting out these high fat, high sugar foods that are very addicting, you know, they've done studies on the brain with sugar for yeah. someone who said they're addicted to sugar and someone who's addicted to cocaine, the same parts yeah. of the brain light up. Yeah. The, same the addiction parts. parts. The addiction parts, exactly. <laughs> I, so, uh, so I, yeah. So now it's you know we've been doing a lot of research on on the microbiome. So that is all of the bacteria that's in your gut. You've got good and bad. Well, the bad guys love sugar. So if you're feeding them sugar, 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 studies show they commute to your uh, communicate to your brain, and they'll say, "I want that super gulp." Now. Mm -hmm. right. And you kind of have this internal struggle. I know I shouldn't have it, but it's, it's the, the bacteria talking to your brain. No, you're going to have it. And you're like, no, I don't want it. And you're <laughs> like fighting and you end up having it. Right. It's because it's communicating to your brain. So there's so, there's so much to it, you know? So I can't say like, oh, it's hormones. I think it's, I think it's a ton of different things out there, you know, that, that have happened. And, and I, especially, um... especially if you're a kid, you know, you, you uh -huh. get used to, you, you get hooked at an earlier age, right? And it just gets With so much sugar, harder. Exactly. It gets so yeah. much harder to, 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 to get, to change your, be, change your diet. Right. I have, uh, um, I have a final question while Ray sets up for our participants to participate in our program. Sure, sure. Um, and before I ask it, please tell Beaver Cleaver to eat his Brussels sprouts. <laughs> but anyway, <laughs> okay, so we hear a lot about vitamin supplements and we also hear yes. that there are plenty of good vitamins in our food. Where do you balance the two out? Do you think that there's a need for vitamin supplements all the time? Or should we just eat the right foods and get all the nutritional vitamins that we need? You know, so there are certain circumstances where you should uh, maybe uh, get a certain vitamin like vitamin D. Vitamin D is very difficult to get in this area. Um, you know, so sometimes like, you know, w with the supervision of a doctor, then that's okay. Um, but in general, no, you should not, you should not. Um, and there's a lot of reasons for that. For one, they're not regulated by the FDA. So someone can just put together a sugar pill, sell it to you online, you know, and it's like, oh yeah, I'm going to have this. 
there are some vitamins that you can take that actually have caused a lot of adverse health effects, heart attacks. Um, there was one with vitamin A and prostate cancer. There was a huge link there. Um, so taking large, large, large doses of these vitamins, it's, your body will not absorb it like it would with, with uh, food. Um, and there was this really cool study. Um, so avocados, they have what's uh, lutein and zeaxanthin, right? So they wanted to know, because that's good for the eyes. They wanted to know, all right, people who took the supplements of like lutein and zeaxanthin, if they would fare better than people who ate like an avocado, right? So the supplement had like a huge amount more. The avocado only had like two micrograms or something really small. The people who had macular degeneration had so much more of the lutein and zeaxanthin in their eyes than the group did with the humongous dose of the lutein. And that's, be and that's because the body will use all of the other, you know, vitamins and minerals that are in that to help you absorb it better. You're just going to throw a ton of one vitamin, your body's not going to absorb it. Right. So it's always best to get it from nutrition, you know, unless your doctor says like specifically, you know, even um, with elders, like they have a hard time absorbing uh, B12 because they have less gastric juices, then then that's OK. Um, but general rule of thumb, it's good to uh, just eat it from your food. Okay. okay. Ray, so do we have anybody? We do. We have one person so far, but I just want to quickly go over this really quickly to uh, raise and lower your hand on PC. It's alt Y uh, option Y on Mac uh, star nine on the telephone and on your smartphone. It's under the more options, I believe. Um, and then for muting alt a on PC uh, command option a on Mac uh star six on the telephone and uh lower left i think on the smartphones so um that being said uh rich k you are up next and when you're done asking your question if you could just please mute yourself that would be awesome thank you hi, hi rich. my name is rich and i'm, I'm just wondering uh you're talking about exercise and i read a book a few years ago about saying that if I would exercise before I ate, I would, that would stop my motel, set up my motel, speed up my metabolism. So when I ate, I would burn the calories off faster. Huh. So I actually recommend that people eat, yeah, after they exercise. Um, so I would say that is correct, not necessarily for a metabolism perspective, um, but actually it's for, um, your, your muscle building. So if you think about it, right? So say I just, you know, I just ran, right? I, I, I did some running, I came back. I used a lot of muscle, right? Doing that and they're hungry. So 30 to 60 minutes after you've had some exercise, you have to feed those muscles. Cause like I was saying earlier, your muscles are constantly building up, breaking down, building up, breaking down like every day. So when they're hungry, you want to build those muscles back up. So feed them protein. So that way your muscles will stay stronger. So if you exercise and you don't eat after your exercise, it's kind of useless because you miss that opportunity to feed your muscles. Yeah, Rich, so what I, do is I get up in the morning and I get on the exercise bike for 20 minutes. Yeah. And then I eat my oatmeal. Yeah. And then I, then I walk this, I walk about 15 to 20 floors in, upstairs in my building. Wow. After I eat my oatmeal. Yeah. What do you make with your oatmeal? How do you make it? With water, I, I, with milk? I, I, I buy, I buy um, steel cut oats and I yeah. cook it in a crock pot once a week with, with, with um, cinnamon and almond milk. Ooh, and that almond good. milk. Okay. Do you, um, I'm trying to, if we can add some protein to that, have you ever added peanut? I do this all the time. Do you ever add uh, peanut butter to your oatmeal? I haven't, but would you add it be in the cooking process or after it's cooked? You could. I've done it both ways. So I've added it when I'm cooking it over the stove top, you know, or I've added it afterwards um, because yeah. the, that has a lot of protein in it as well. Um, so I like when I make my oatmeal, I try to make it with 
If you have cow's milk, if that's not an issue, that has at least eight grams of protein per cup. So that's great that you're getting a good start with that. But if you're lactose intolerant, then almond milk is perfectly fine. Yeah, um, I'm, I have lactose issue. But, gotcha. Okay. Yep. So, so, but see, because I make a week's worth at a time in a crock pot, and then they're more nice. than throw in the microwave. Yep. Yep. Where, so where, you can. Oh. Oh, so you can do that um, and you can add the peanut butter to it and maybe some almonds or, uh, you know, any kind of nut that also has protein in it as well. Okay. Thank you very much. Rich, where are you from? Rich, where are you from? Uh, Worcester, Massachusetts. Worcester. Uh, welcome. So Not Stephanie. from us. That's right. Stephanie, I, I, this, this will probably amuse you, but what I find is I, when I get up, usually pretty soon after I get up, I either go for a five mile walk with a friend or I run the treadmill for 45 minutes. And what I find is I'm hungry when, when I get up. And when I finish uh, doing my exercise, I'm far less hungry and I can wait to eat for a couple of hours. Now that's probably not very healthy from what you just said, but that's what I find. My, my hunger uh, dissipates a little bit and I can, I can hold off eating for a while. Yeah. So what do you have for, so when you first wake up, what do you have for breakfast? Uh, usually nothing, which I know is like totally unhealthy. Uh, you, oh, I'll, okay. I'll, 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 I'll have water or I might have a, have a glass of like cranberry juice or something. Um, okay. but, but, but I don't eat anything at all. I just, you know, get up and go. Yeah. Uh, and, and I, and I, you know, I'm sure this is like totally unhealthy from, from your perspective, but, but, <laughs> but, but, but I do find that, you know, I'm not nearly as hungry when I get back and I can hold off for a couple of hours. Yeah. So, you, you know, Stephanie, it's funny that Peter brought that up because I know a doctor right here in the New Bedford area. I'm not going to mention who it is, mm -hmm. that if a patient goes to her and says, I don't eat very much breakfast at all, I, say the patient is like Peter, the doctor, believe it or not, would say, that's OK. Eat when you're hungry. <laughs> she doesn't care about how healthy breakfast food is. She'll just say, it's OK. Eat when you're hungry. Well, this, but, but this raises a question for me, Stephanie. And Ray, if there's another question, please let, please let we, us know. We have um, <clears throat> three people we need to try and get through. Oh, um, wow. Okay. Can we come and, back to your question? Yeah, yeah. Well, no, ab ab absolutely. Yeah. Go Thank right you ahead. for letting me know, Ray. Okay. Go ahead, Ray. Uh, Greg Tyler, you are up next. If you can please unmute yourself and ask your question. And when you are done, just mute yourself, please. Oh, okay. Um, I was just wondering, uh, you know, the chicken tenders that everybody likes so much are a little uh, fattening. I was thinking about this, taking some uh, canned chicken and basically using uh, that nice device, the air fryer. And I don't know if that's, you know, the air frying of food is much healthier than the other way. So I'll throw that out there. But I was trying to make something healthy, you know. Uh, I'll throw it out and see, see what you think of it. Uh, is that a healthy way to cook with the air fryer? The air fryer. So... I would say that all depends on your diet. So, right, your regular pattern of eating. So if you're someone who, you know, had maybe say like a lot of fat, like earlier on in the day, you know, like you were cooking with oil or maybe had some French fries, you had like some other things and you're thinking, oh, like maybe later on in the day, it's probably best that I, uh, you know, use the air fryer. Um, you know, cause some people cook with a lot of oil, you know, depending on like certain cultures and things like that, you know, so if they're trying to cut back on the amount of oil and the amount of fat that they're eating, you know, then yes, absolutely. That's a great tool that you can use. Um, you know, but if like generally speaking, you know, you do need fat with meals um, to help you absorb certain vitamins. So I would say it's all like a balancing act, you know, don't do everything in the air fryer, you know, because you do need some fat if you want to cook with oil. Um, but it's also a good tool to use at the same time. So if you, you know, like I was saying earlier, if you need to switch it up, you've had a lot of ice cream and like, you know, bacon and like all these other things. Yeah, maybe later on, I'm going to use that air fryer when I'm making my chicken. Th thank you, Rich. Or Greg. Sorry, Greg. Thanks, Greg. Um, all Greg, right. Where, where, where are you from, Greg, if you're still if you're still uh, unmuted? Yeah, I'm, uh, I'm from Maryland. Okay, awesome. Thank you for joining us, Greg. Who thank do we you. have next, Ray? All right, next up is Angela. You're next. Angela. Angela. You may want to unmute yourself okay. first. Oh, there you yeah. are. So I just wanted to comment, comment about the exercise thing, eating after exercise. Yeah. I do um, a yoga class and different ACB yoga classes and stuff, exercise classes. 
And I find that information very interesting because <laughs> my mom tries to have dinner done right after I get done exercising because I'm really hungry after exercising. <laughs> Good, good. Feed those muscles. Feed those Even muscles, with yoga, yeah. yoga is a terrific exercise. You know, it really builds your core, you know, stretches. I mean, all of that, you know, there has to be a lot of strength when you're do- doing yoga. So absolutely, right after having yoga, like I said, 30 to 60 minutes, you know, have your meal within that time frame after you exercise. Sounds like a good plan. Okay, very good. Thank Works you, Works for me. Thank you very much. And Ray, was there somebody else after that? Yes, one last person, and that is Beth on the telephone. Yes, Beth. Hello, Beth. Hello. I have a question for you. <laughs> well, I wanted to tell Stephanie, yes, these marketing companies do know what they're doing because, um, like, There's a lot of seniors now, you know, a lot of widows and widowers or a lot of people that live alone or even or even college kids that instead of buying a whole thing of groceries, I mean, they have you have all this frozen food and this other food at your disposal. And you're like, man, I don't want to cook a whole big old thing for for just one or two people. So you cook these frozen foods for are those are those good for you or Uh, that's a great question or no that's a great question so i actually went on um one of our local grocery stores website and what i did was i looked at all of the frozen meals that were there And I saw, okay, like which ones were the lowest in sodium, which ones had so much protein, which, you know, all the things. And there are some good options out there. Um, There are a ton of bad ones too, (laughs) you know? So once you find, uh, you know, like a good one, then it's like, okay, like I know. So what I would do for my consumers is, you know, because I do work with the elder population a lot, you know, and I hear that all the time. Like, you know, I don't, I don't feel like cooking, you know, and is hungry man good? Is this good? Is that kind good? You know? Um, so we go over like reading labels. Okay. So there's so much sodium in this one, you know? Um, but I find with those, I don't like the diet ones that like, um, you know, that say like, Oh, this is a diet version of this one. A lot of times they're really low calorie, which of course for, for seniors, I, I don't recommend that a super low calorie. Um, it's low in protein and like really high sodium. So it's like, okay, that's not a good, a good balance. You want to have a good amount of protein. You know, you want to have it to have more calories than 120 calories for a meal. That's just not enough, (laughs) you know? So, um, so there are plenty of good options, you know, and I actually had one today. I had a frozen meal today. So, cause I didn't do groceries and I was running late to work and I said, you know, what? I'm just going to throw this in my bag, you know, but I found one ahead of time. Like, I know this is a good one and you know, that's, that's what I did. So there are good options. Again, it's just about navigating and reading the food labels and figuring out, okay, which ones are, are pretty good. Thank you. Thank you, Beth. Ray, is but, there anybody- but if you're visually impaired and you don't really, I mean, even though someone will go to the store with you, they don't really want to take time to read all those labels and stuff like that, you know? Yep. Yep. You know, so that's why it's nice. Like once you find a good one, so like if whoever's doing your grocery, so say you pick like healthy choice, just to throw out one, you know, and you're like, Hey, wow, this is really good. It's got a nice, good portion of protein, like the size of my, the palm of my hand, it's got fresher vegetables, you know, I like this one, you know, so once, you know, you can say, Hey, can you get me that same one again? You know, that, so kind of come up with a list, you know, that's why I try to tell people to do. Cause, it, yeah. Yeah. It, it, it's, it's hard to start, but once you get started, it's a little easier, right, you know? right. Uh, but yeah. and especially for blind people, cause you really do need more help up front. Yeah. But once you get that help yeah. and you get, you get into a pattern, it's a little easier to, to do it, but you know, it's, it's, it's like any other habit, right? It's hard to right? start and it's a little harder for us blind folks. Cause we, it's harder, it's harder for us to read labels, you know? So, right. uh, but, right. but right. it just complicates starting a new habit to begin with. 
Yeah. So, uh, other right. thing, the other thing that's hard is we don't see the fine print, like uh, mm. what percentage of sodium, what percentage of this, what percentage of that. Things that people may not need to consume with their food. Right. Right. But it tastes good. So yeah, there is not. <laughs> There's not anyone with any questions, uh, but I would like to make a comment sure. and uh, possibly, yeah, a question too. Um, so my comment would be that I don't know how many people know that there are websites that list some of these things on. So if you, again, like once you figure out the brands you like, um, they, there's our websites that list this information, like the mm -hmm. calories or nutritional information and stuff. And I know that if you're good at doing research online, um, I know that may not be a solution for everybody, but it is an option. And a lot of times yeah. you can also ask your smart devices if you have them. And if not, that's understandable too, but they can also help you too. Mm -hmm. um, my question is, is sushi. So, you know, they have sushi, various different types of sushi that you can, uh, some stores make them. Um, is that a um, good option? If it's just like the fish or the, the sushi, the rice, and then the, the vegetables as a, uh, as a um, dietary option for someone, if that's what they like. Yeah. You know, if you, if it's a, a trusted, uh, you know, a trusted place, if the, the sushi has to be treated with a vinegar solution, um, that's, you know, general like food safety, um, uh, guidelines there. So if you like sushi, then all the power to you, you know, if you, if that's something that you really enjoy, you know, it's nice because it's like so many portions, right. You know, they're like nice and small. Um, but you know, you are getting, you know, some starch, some vegetable, like some protein. So you're kind of getting a little bit of everything, but absolutely it can fit into a healthy, well-balanced diet. We have about one minute, Stephanie, and I'm very compelled to ask you this question. It's okay. kind of off topic, but not quite. Okay. You know about the hot dog eating contest on the 4th of July. Can you please tell us how Joey <laughs> Chestnut eats 76 hot dogs and 76 buns in 10 minutes? How does I don't he do think, it? I don't think he's human. <laughs> I appreciate There's you no telling way. me that. I'm trying to find the answer to that question. I, you, they must be like, they must stretch out their stomachs so much that they're able to ingest that much. How do you stretch out a stomach that much? I you train. They train. They you train, train all yeah. the time. They oh. train. It's like running a marathon. But, it, how it, about, it, but how about the rapidity of digestion and the rapidity I, of swallowing? That's another thing. It's, oh. it's, it's like, I, you know, I, I, I don't understand either, but I do know he trains, you know, and I don't, oh. how he does it and what his pattern <laughs> is is totally beyond me, but I know he trains. Yeah. Stephanie, our time wow. is up. I just couldn't oh resist goodness. asking you that question yeah. to, to oh finish man. the program. Stephanie, you've been bringing a lot of knowledge to people for many years. You do it with your clients. You did it for us today and our listeners. And I want to thank you. And I know Peter does too. And Ray and our participants, thank you for trying to keep us healthy with, with our mm -hmm. diets and what we should eat, what we shouldn't eat, and how we should eat in moderation and all yes. that goes with that. Thank you for coming on our program today. Oh, thank you so much for having me. It was a pleasure. Thank you, Stephanie. Thank you. So I want to thank Ray and, of course, Peter. Thank you very much. Uh, next week, hopefully, we're going to have Alex Gray, who is a city council candidate. He's a blind city council candidate in Boston. Go safe, everybody, with God's abundant blessings. And next we will week? Be we will be back. Take care. Take care. Uh, Thank you. Won't you. I think we should also mention, in case I don't think we did in the beginning, that – um, for the next couple of weeks, uh, on the ACB community, uh, community lists, uh, we're not going to be listed. They're, they're not, they're having their own, uh, the con because the convention, they're not doing their normal, uh, listings that they normally do, but we are still recording. That's the but important. we are still recording. Yes. Yeah. So I'm trying to so get for everybody <laughs> else. So for everybody else listening, see you next week. Take Stephanie, care. Everybody. Before you go, I, I need to tell you something. Okay. Uh, you know, you, you work for Coastline Elder Services or something, correct? I, I do, yes. I kept wanting to say Wasteline Elder Services. What? <laughs> uh, so for whatever it's worth, unfortunately, I didn't make that mistake. But, boy, I, I came close. Uh, wasteline. That's wasteline, funny. yes. Wasteline, <laughs> yeah. So, anyway, thank you so much for doing this. We, sh we should bring you back because there are tons of other questions I wanted to yeah, ask. Yeah, so, uh, I know. I'd be happy to come back. back. Okay, well, we'll, we'll figure it